Hello and I hope you've been keeping well. Today we're going to talk about Pygmalion. Once there was a Cypriot sculptor named Pygmalion. He spent most of his life totally uninterested in women, but one day he carved a sculpture of a woman so beautiful that he fell in love with it. He was unable to admit that to himself or anyone else, and so he languished for a long time in silence. Now, the festival of Aphrodite in Cyprus came around, and Pygmalion made an offering of livestock and a prayer for a partner who looked exactly like the statue he'd carved and had been unable to bring himself to sell. When he returned home, the statue itself had come to life and become a real person. She was named Galatea, Milk White. The two had a child, Paphos, and they lived and died in as much happiness as was allowed men and women in their time. Now, I thought about this story for some time, and I haven't thought about it for a while. I've had this script sitting about, but I thought we should probably dash it up a bit and, you know, talk about it, since there's some insight there, just a little bit. But, as with everything else that's put on this channel, please don't take it too seriously. So, first we should point out the obvious meaning by stripping the god of its personal veneer and understanding it as an abstract con concept. Aphrodite, what is she? Lust, love, desire, etc. She's creative and destructive, supportive, possessive. She's all of these things at once. And now because all of the nuance of this myth matters in the interpretation, it's important to establish exactly what's going on. Love or desire is what brings Galatea to life, but it can't be her own desire. She's inanimate. She doesn't have a personality. She doesn't have a life with which to desire anything. Galatea is immobile but for love. Without it, she's unable to move. So is she awakened by a random whim of Aphrodite? I would argue no, because Aphrodite in this particular tale is nothing more than the personification of the concept of love. She's not a proper personality in her own right, as she would be in, say, Peleus and Thetis' wedding. Sadly, because of this fact, her particular personal quirks will have to be put aside for the moment. So, who are, who's left? Is it Pygmalion's will? I think we're getting warmer. By his prayer to the abstract concept of love, he awakens Galatea. This implies several things. The first thing is the link between the mind and the body. Pygmalion is Galatea's creator, and by virtue of having literally carved her from stone, he knows her inside and out. Perhaps this is why only he would have been able to animate her in the first place. By knowing the body, he was able to conceive of the mind. Any random passerby who happened to look through Pygmalion's workshop window and see Galatea just sitting around in there could have fallen in love with her and prayed to Aphrodite to bring her to life, but it would have only worked for Pygmalion, because only he could understand the kind of person she could potentially have been if she were alive. The body's structure informs the mind. In other words, the personality as well. You think about the arrangement of your own neurons. They're put in a certain sequence, which means you think of things in a particular way. It makes you who you are. There's a physical makeup that informs our abstract understanding. The same idea is found here. So what's the second idea that we can pull from this? There's something about the love of art, I think. Aphrodite's action in animating Galatea is a reciprocation of the effort that Pygmalion put into building her. I think carving a statue, especially one that's, as, that's detailed enough for a fully cognizant and presumably mostly sane man to fall in love with, is a considerable task, as I'm sure you can imagine. His prayer, then, is not the reason that Galatea awoke. It was because she had been built with the utmost care. Because Pygmalion had offered his life to the creation of beauty, he'd sacrificed his time to the idea of love in creating the most beautiful thing he could. His prayer was literally the act of building the statue. The ten minutes it took for him to go down to the local temple and, you know, offer a chicken or something, was, that was just, that was a symbolic gesture. That wasn't where the meaning was. By his falling in love with her, Pygmalion was not, in fact, going insane. Although modern proponents of the story would, modern proponents, modern retellers of the story would imply that this was so, and the, the modern mind tends to conceive of it that way because the moderns don't understand how the Greek people used to think. The story shows us what happens with artists and art. You know, spend enough time with a project and you'll begin to love it too. In this case, the art, or, well, Aphrodite, but the thing behind the art, reciprocates. That's the only difference between this story and something that we would consider more realistic. You know, there's a relevant quote from Zorba the Greek, 
Uh, behind each woman rises the austere, sacred, and mysterious face of Aphrodite. That was the face Zorba was seeing and talking to and desiring. Dame Hortense was only an ephemeral and transparent mask which Zorba tore away to kiss the eternal mouth. <clears throat> Sorry, coronavirus. So too has Pygmalion fallen in love, not necessarily with Galatea, but with the very concept of beauty and of making it. So what else is there? Point three, the point of art. Wait, you say, isn't this whole thing just a form of cheap ancient wish fulfillment? You're wasting your time taking it apart in all this detail. You know, Pygmalion was a lonely sculptor. He had no prospects. It seems awfully sexist that he would be able to just build himself a partner. It's like the ancient equivalent of a sad modern man building himself a sex bot and calling it a waifu. And yeah, okay, okay, sure, yes. It's possible to interpret the whole thing in that manner and brush it away, but then why does Galatea reciprocate? Is that just an extension of the wish fulfillment? Frankly, I've got a higher opinion of the ancients than to assume there's any of that occurring in the first place. See, what I've not actually said out loud, but kind of have grown to think more and more over the past couple of months, is that you can get the entire core of what's possible for human philosophy out of the first couple of civilizations. And, you know, everything that was done after the fall of Rome is mostly a waste of time in philosophical terms and something that you could pro probably sum up in five minutes because, you know, the sum totality of human experience was mostly touched on by Greeks and Romans and then the rest of it is just kind of technological improvements that slightly change the way that the next generation has seen the world. So of course there's plenty to talk about, it's just that, and plenty has been talked about and in great detail and with great skill and intelligence, it's just that you could probably find a reasonably coherent forerunner to every modern idea somewhere in the classics. Obviously I have no way to prove that because I don't even know Greek, but it's, it's, it's an idea that's growing in my mind. So time, I guess, will bear it out as we all learn more. Uh, okay, back to Galatea. The, the Galatea story's central theme is the idea that there's a point to all of this. You know, there's a point to beauty. Beauty can give back. It's not just a, a fruitless time-wasting lark to while away Pygmalion's life until he gets old and dies. But it's something that affirms existence. It's a secular miracle. His creation of the statue is a secular miracle that results in a literal miracle because the statue comes to life. Interestingly, it seems to have free will, so maybe the ancients understood the death of the author thousands of years before we did. Well, I'll leave that to someone else to answer. What else is there to say? Lesson four. Yes, Baudrillard. Everyone knows Baudrillard? Simulacra and simulation. In that essay, he talks about how modern society has replaced all substance with symbols and signifiers instead. The simulacra are aspects of culture, television, film, writing, etc., that inform our worldviews. Now, he divided the process of this replacement into four stages. The sign is made, it represents reality. The sign then becomes an unfaithful copy of reality. And we know that it's an unfaithful copy, it's a false representation. On the third stage, that's where we have Pygmalion and Galatea, and they're sitting and laughing. Now there's a copy, but there's no original. The fourth stage is something that Roberto Calasso wrote about in Cadmus and Harmony, when he talked about Helen multiplying into a series of eidolons. Let me just see if I can't find that passage. If I can't, we'll move on, but... I'm fairly sure I remember the exact page, yes, page 133. Behind what the Greeks called eidolon, which is at once the idol, the statue, the simulacrum, the phantom, lies the mental image. This fanciful and insubstantial creature imitates the world and at the same time subjects it to a frenzy of different combinations, confounding its forms in inexhaustible proliferation. It emanates a prodigious strength, our awe in the face of what we can see in the invisible. It has all the features of the arbitrary, of what is born in the dark, from formlessness, the way our world was perhaps once born. 
But this time the chaos is the vast shadowy canvas that lies behind our eyes and on which phosphenic patterns constantly merge and fade. Such constant formation of images occurs in each one of us in every instant, but these are not the only peculiarities of the phenomenon. When the phantom, the mental image, takes over our minds, when it begins to join with other similar or alien figures, then, little by little, it fills the whole space of the mind, in an ever more detailed and ever richer concatenation. What initially presented itself as the prodigy of appearance, cut off from everything, is now linked from one phantom to another, to everything. So, the simulacra multiply, and they interact only with each other to fill our minds. They replace reality with a collection of signs and symbols that only relate to each other. The culture drops all pretense of reality and only interacts with other aspects of itself, other symbols. Any relation to human experience has totally disappeared. So what I am saying is that the Greeks had already figured out Baudrillard thanks to their conception of the Aedolon and how it related to Helen and Galatea. Helen was stuck on the first level, meaning she had a perfect copy, while Galatea represented something much darker, despite the story being one of the few genuinely happy ones in Greek myth. By the way, the fact that the story comes with a happy ending is itself a note of warning in any Mediterranean myth. You know, the notion that Pygmalion is allowed to escape scot-free from an encounter with the divine does raise my eyebrow a fraction. Now, of course, you can interpret the story differently. Depending on your personal values, we can see the man's future with Galatea as a complete disaster or a literal heaven-sent conclusion. One thing is absolutely sure, though, and that is that she is a simulacrum. The Greeks, perhaps unintentionally, are making the point that the simulacrum can only be the same as the real thing through divine intervention, that without Aphrodite taking pity on the lonely sculptor, Galatea would have remained nothing more than a representation, and the mere fact that she is allowed to live does not mitigate that fact. And the fact is also that the Greeks never included stories in their religion for frivolous reasons. There was a good reason to think of Pygmalion and Galatea as real, and I think it was to demonstrate the shifting line between the real and the fake. People in the past 500 years, and I'll talk more about this another time, but people in the past 500 years or so since the Protestants have become largely obsessed with materialism as the only correct method of thought in direct contravention to their cultural heritage and to the detriment of the quality of their personal lives at the expense of scientific development. I wrote the first part of this essay to guess at why Galatea existed. I write the second part now to affirm her importance. I concern myself here with trying to dispel the notion that we have reached a logical end point to history and that we have discovered the ultimate mode of interpreting the world in modern objective scientific testing. This is a short document that aims to collect evidence to dispel a certain type of thought that I find poisonous, hateful, and unconducive to human joy and learning. The reliance on objective fact and science, not the scientific method, by the way, because that's different, but science, quote-unquote, as the ultimate method of finding truth. The sole belief in materialism and subjective reality is not the end point of logic or of thinking logically. It's merely another framework one that has replaced a method of thought that was once well understood and quite common. In replacing this older mode of thought with modern secular humanism, we are doing an excellent job of unlearning what we have learned as a civilization by making it increasingly difficult to understand our own history and the way our ancestors once understood the world. The pre-modern alternative to secular humanist thought is alive, it's logical, it's worth preserving. I concern myself here with one aspect of that mindset, the belief that fiction is true and that truth is not synonymous with fact. The idea that an event is true and that the event happened in reality are different. While such a position may initially appear to be a case of senseless semantics made for the sake of propping up pedantic poets, it must be accounted for if the modern world is to retain a sense of how humanity used to think and for us to continue wading through the unnameable present. Why do we need to understand how people used to think? Or, to put the question in grander terms, what is the point of learning history? Well, historical education, in my experience, until my final year of schooling, 
and I'll talk more about this at another time, but it was something so excessively focused on war that it turned most of my cohort away. Endless study of the First and Second World Wars and of the Cold War doesn't interest everyone, and that's fair enough. It's unfortunate that everyone's first history class wasn't a more general class, that instead of learning about one of the two world wars, we weren't immediately made to understand why it was important to understand. Isn't that the question all cynical students ask of their classwork? Why are we studying this? What use will I have for quadratics and wider society and so on? Now, I think it's fairly obvious that definition is division, and to a more belligerent mind, it's phrased as competition. And so the reason for studying history in and of itself becomes a little clearer from that point. We want to know what we were so that we can know what we now are, understand a bit about everything around us based on what it once was, and perhaps forecast the future very carefully. Now, this is a somewhat unorthodox source, but I like to refer to it anyway, a quote from the Bethesda Softworks 2003 game Morrowind that perfectly encapsulates for me the simple beauty of history. When we understand the events that have happened to us, those events become history, otherwise we're all just animals trying to get out of the cold. But there is another good reason for us to bother with it all, and that is less to do with specific factual evidence than story-based mythic evidence. I say mythic not in the sense of a story so old that its veracity is suspect or something so supernatural and unrealistic as to be obviously non-factual. Remember, truth and fact are different, and I'll, I'll address that later. But I mean it in the sense of national myth, something like a... <clears throat> excuse me, coronavirus. Something like a romanticization of the life of Garibaldi or Napoleon. In other words, it's a story that even if it's not necessarily true, it informs a culture's outlook as, as if it were factual anyway, and thus it provides insight into a culture's valued traits, psychic, material, behavioral. Example, Odysseus was a valued hero to the ancients because Athena blessed him with cunning. He was a multifaceted man, polythropon. But claiming that Athena blessed him, while it is essentially a religious statement, it's also tacitly understood as a symbolic representation of Odysseus's intelligence. Rather, it's not that Athena is the symbol of intelligence. Greeks didn't think that way. She wasn't an abstraction. She was the concept of strategy itself. She existed in as much as the concept of logic, intelligence, mathematics, etc., and so on and so on did. No matter the degree to which they pl proclaim themselves to be logical and objective, people tend to think narratively. Ancients understood the idea of a poetic or a symbolic truth that does not exactly correspond with what happens in reality, but reflects it, beautifies it, sorts it into a pattern or into a mode of thought, so as to make it possible for us to understand it. They understood that intuitively. It was the default mode of thought in Europe for thousands of years. Materialist, secular humanism has largely replaced it for most people. And it's worth keeping around, because the system that we've tried to switch to, to use a computing term, is not cross-compatible, is not amenable to retaining a historically accurate understanding of events across time. It's already impossible to understand how the ancients thought about concepts like the good and beauty, which are terms that everyone tosses around, we don't understand them now. You know, they're hard enough to get without materialists and fact-based secular humanists muddying the waters further by raising generations of themselves with this ridiculously restrictive set of axioms that restrict our modes of belief to the scientifically provable. By the way, science, quote-unquote, as a system, is like any system of beliefs. It makes sense to you because you've been raised to believe it and it justifies itself. So you might say, okay, well, you sound ridiculous. Do you not believe in the scientific method? Odd question, first of all. How can I disbelieve in a method? Of course I believe in the fact that scientific testing of nature and the resulting technology has resulted in a great deal of seemingly accurate results and material benefits for us, and I think it's a net improvement for our lives in many aspects. Chiefly concerning me at this moment is my ability to talk to you. After all, I do spend large chunks of my time tinkering with new operating systems, and I enjoy it immensely. You know, I played a ton of video games when I was a kid and wasted my time like anyone else. I just discarded the idea. The only thing that sets me apart from people around me is that I discarded the idea of progress for its own sake, 
and I tossed away the idea of material existence being the only relevant metric of intelligence or sophistication or the quality of one's internal and external life. But this isn't the time to talk about that. Consider that the idea of endless testing to discover the rules of nature is not something that evolved with the Enlightenment and modernity, but something that existed alongside a purely religious mode of thought for thousands of years, and it didn't see any conflict until Protestants arrived and tried to equate truth with fact. There's an interesting essay from over 10 years ago now, I think 13 years ago, by Mencius Moldbug, where he talks about something called an ultra-Calvinist. Now, the modern enlightened atheist is actually thinking in the same way that a Christian would, which is to say a Protestant. He thinks with that same religious mode. He just doesn't realize it. The qualities of, of the secular humanist and the ultra-Calvinist are the same. There are four values that they respect, fraternalism, pacifism, the fair distribution of goods, and a managed society, a society led by, benevol by benevolent public servants. These are originally Calvinist ideals. Hence, people who believe themselves to be atheists, who believe in those principles, are crypto-Christians. Protestants have always had this fixation on theology as fact, as something to be falsified or proven in a material framework. And so-called atheists think in the same terms. But truth is not the same as fact, and religion before Luther didn't ask anyone to accept it as fact. It was accepted as truth, not fact. <clears throat> By far the best defense of poetic truth that I have ever read, and the quickest path to understanding it, comes from Robert Graves in his text, The White Goddess. <clears throat> what interests me most in conducting this argument is the difference that is constantly appearing between the poetic and the prosaic methods of thought. The prosaic method was invented by the Greeks of the classical age as an insurance against the swamping of reason by mythographic fancy. It has now become the only legitimate means of transmitting useful knowledge. And in England, as in most other mercantile countries, the current popular view is that music and old-fashioned diction are the only characteristics of poetry which distinguish it from prose, that every poem has, or should have, a precise single-strand prose equivalent. As a result, the poetic faculty is atrophied in every educated person who does not privately struggle to cultivate it, very much as the faculty of understanding pictures is atrophied in the Bedouin Arab. T. E. Lawrence once showed a coloured crayon sketch of an Arab sheikh to the sheikh's own clansmen. They passed it from hand to hand, but the nearest guess as to what it represented came from a man who took the sheikh's foot to be the horn of a buffalo. And from the inability to think poetically, to resolve speech into its original images and rhythms, and recombine these on several simultaneous levels of thought into a multiple sense, derives the failure to think clearly in prose. In prose, one thinks on only one level at a time, and no combination of words needs to contain more than a single sense. Nevertheless, the images resident in words must be securely related if the passage is to have any bite. This simple need is forgotten. What passes for simple prose nowadays is a mechanical stringing together of stereotyped word groups without regard for the images contained within them. The mechanical style, sorry, the mechanical style which began in the counting house has now infiltrated into the university. Some of its most zombie-esque instances occurring in the works of eminent scholars and divines. Mythographic statements, which are perfectly reasonable to the few poets who can still think and talk in poetic shorthand, seem either nonsensical or childish to nearly all literary scholars. Such statements, I mean, as Mercury invented the alphabet after watching the flight of cranes, or Menu ab Tirqued saw three rowan rods growing out of the mouth of Einigen Fór, with every kind of knowledge and science written on them. The best that the scholars have yet done for the poems of Guion is Wild and Sublime, and they never question the assumption that he, his colleagues, and his public were people of either stunted or undisciplined intelligence. The joke is that the more prose-minded the scholar, the more capable he is supposed to be of interpreting ancient poetic meaning, and that no scholar dares to set himself up as an authority on more than one narrow subject for fear of incurring the dislike and suspicion of his colleagues. To know only one thing well is to have a barbaric mind, 
civilization implies the graceful relation of all varieties of experience to a central humane system of thought. The present age is particularly barbaric. Introduce, say, a Hebrew scholar to an ichthyologist or an authority on Danish place names, and the pair of them would have no single topic in common but the weather or the war, if there happened to be a war in progress, which is usual in this barbaric age. But that so many scholars are barbarians does not much matter, so long as a few of them are ready to help with their specialized knowledge, the few independent thinkers, that is to say the poets, who try to keep civilization alive. The scholar is a quarryman, not a builder, and all that is required of him is that he should quarry cleanly. He is the poet's insurance against factual error. It is easy enough for the poet in this hopelessly muddled and inaccurate modern world to be misled into false etymology, anachronism, and mathematical absurdity by trying to be what he is not. His function is truth, whereas the scholar's is fact. Fact is not to be gainsaid. One may put it in this way, that fact is a tribune of the people with no legislative right, but only the right of veto. Fact is not truth but a poet who willfully defies fact cannot achieve truth. I'm tempted to leave the argument there, but there's more I personally want to talk about that didn't really fall under the scope of that argument. So to supplement his words, there's an exemplar. The death of the famous Chinese poet Li Bai, according to a persistent legend, occurred thusly. The inebriated poet, sailing one evening in deep waters, leaned too far over the edge of his boat, and he drowned in an, in an attempt to embrace the moon. This is factually false, he literally historically died of some disease, but the argument for poetic truth runs concurrently to the fact. So here's a multiple choice exam for you. Li Bai, it's worth one mark, by the way, you have 40 minutes and 10 minutes for perusal. Li Bai threw away his life in a rebellious quest for beauty, A, by drowning himself trying to embrace the moon's reflection, and B, by devoting his entire life to poetry and ignoring his physical health. I'm not going to stand here for 40 minutes. You know the answer by now if you've been listening to me. It's both. It's a trick question. The two ideas converge in their result and in their meaning. Li Bai is dead as a result of his excessive passion in either case. In this case, since the factual truth is known to us, we choose to accept it as what happened of the legend, which is regarded by most as a flight of fancy. But the symbolic meaning is the same. I realize that, to an extent, this is an argument from emotion. You know, the belief that Levi's legend is more beautiful than the truth doesn't negate the fact that he literally died of disease, but I make a dichotomy between fact and truth because fact is something that I would like to leave to, as a more scientific, a more objective word than truth, which is something more abstract than what we take it to be, something understood with a kind of logical faculty we're no longer taught. And it's that thing that Robert Graves was calling the poetic mind. You know, truth requires more than one sphere of understanding, more than one fetish to understand what it is. You know, it's the intersection of disciplines. And you can't get there just by being objective. And then, of course, somebody would tell me, if I told them this, they would say, that's only because of how you've chosen to define truth. I could define truth as being a series of corresponding facts that add to an accurate statement or conclusion, and your argument would make no sense. And yes, that's quite true, and in respect to the changing nature of words and their meanings, I won't do something as crass as refer to a dictionary definition. I'll just say that that's what it means to have a poetic mindset, and it's worth preserving because it allows you to continue to understand your history, and thus better ourselves the more time passes. Instead of throwing both baby and bathwater away, and laying down our intellectual lives and our histories for Elon Musk and Disney. So according to this mindset, in order to understand the truth of the world, you have to respect myths, legends, fairy tales, stories. I'd like to take the time to make a somewhat abstract diversion. There is an orthodox Christian idea that people assuming the roles of figures from myths and folktales essentially become them on the outside, while they maintain their individual identities but merely put them aside. So, for example, the man who dresses up as Santa Claus and sits around in the shopping centre is no longer Joe Bloggs, the 35-year-old job hunter struggling to keep his life together. He is Saint Nick, but he is also most definitely not Saint Nick. 
He's become a symbol of Saint Nick. He's become an aspect of him. It's almost pagan in that sense. And so he is him. And the kid babbling around, you know, babbling on his lap about what present they want isn't talking to Joe. They're talking to Santa, even though adult logic tells us that Joe doesn't care and he won't remember any of what the kids said. But by virtue of being addressed as Saint Nick, Joe Bloggs, in some measure, becomes him. And then, of course, the facade ends. You know, Joe takes off the false beard and he goes back to his cheap flat and his debt and his half-finished bottle of beer. And In other words, sometimes God hides. If you're familiar, and I know I shouldn't make the same reference to something that a lot of people won't understand, but if you're familiar with the concept of mantling in the Elder Scrolls, this is somewhat similar. Santa exists in multiple aspects, much like a pagan god. He exists where there is an image of him. He exists and he speaks through the mouth of Joe Bloggs playing that role. And my argument for why art can be true, for why fiction is true, is that art can do the same thing. Art can assume the truth can wear masks. Every character in Umberto Eco's Prague Cemetery is a real person, with the exception of the protagonist. The sentiments described in that book, and many of the events and depictions of certain social groups, are totally real. Sure, the specifics are false, or if they're real, all the things that Simonini did in the novel were probably the works of multiple people, but the essence of the story is totally true. So fiction can be true in the same sense that Santa can be real, in that the child talking to Santa in the shopping center is talking to Santa and not Joe Bloggs. And it's Santa, it's not Joe, who's replying. When I read a book with elements of non-fiction, I can consider those elements as true as anything else. But fiction, in its assumption of a set of prepositions, say that magic exists or the world has been devastated by nuclear warfare before the story has begun, attempts to show us events occurring in an impossible nowhere land. So is it literally true that, say, a, a British boy named Harry Potter accidentally defeated an evil wizard as a baby and was kept in the cupboard for a decade? And so on and so on. Of course, it's not literally true. But because we're reading with it and engaging with it as an internally consistent work, and because it steps up and assumes, like Joe Bloggs, I am in fact Santa, or I am a factual series of fantastic events, and I will now entertain you by telling you, depending on which it is, I'll tell you about what presents you'll receive, or I'll tell you a story about magic or whatever it's about. You know, a story with characters, themes, and a plot. It becomes entirely true. We, we suspend our disbelief, as the child does who asks for a toy tank or a pony from Joe Bloggs. And because we address the book as truth, it assumes that mantle. This is a little different from it being true allegorically, symbolically, or in terms of realism, or the potential to literally happen, obviously. Good books can have those characteristics, but this is a more universal quality than strict realism. I found that there was a spirit to every story. A sort of soul, I suppose, and an overarching meta-story, which is totally true. And the fictional account that was written by an author at a certain point in time is merely assuming the meta-story's soul to talk to us for a bit, rest us on its knee, promise us a good story. So fiction rises to the level of truth, it assumes its mask, if only for a while, and it reflects reality, it reflects truth. Then it might step back into the safety of the false and the fantastic once more, the message, the logos, the truth, again concealing itself because sometimes God hides. But we've never quite managed to reach that perfect equivalence, the piece of insane troll logic that allows us to connect what literally did not ever happen with what literally did happen on the same level without additional qualifiers. The only way you can make the claim that fiction and reality, excuse me, fiction and reality are identical is by moving the goalposts and saying, well, you know, they're true, they're both the same within a particular abstract space, such as inside the brain or in writing. But in reality, it's not possible to assign untruth and truth the same qualities. You can't do that except through abstraction. It's for that reason that the modern variety of cynics and atheists and secular humanist bugmen deride the notion of a spiritual life, and indeed anything that exists outside of physical, scientific, quantifiable evidence, because within their framework of values, a fact is more important than a truth. More specifically, a fact is the only thing that leads to a truth, an empirically observed, testified, 
utterly knowable fact is all that exists. To speak frankly, I find that view incredible in its short-sightedness and condescending in its simplicity, not least because the secular humanists like the rest of us have no way to verify the truth of anything. My first thoughts on this topic invariably flit to an example of Taoist literature, which you may know well, Zhuangzi's famous parable of the butterfly. Once upon a time I, Zhuangzi, dreamt I was a butterfly flut fluttering hither and thither and thither, there. To all intents and purposes, a butterfly. I was conscious only of my happiness as a butterfly, unaware that I was Zhuangzi. Soon I awakened, and there I was, veritably, veritably myself again. Now I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly, or whether I am now a butterfly dreaming I am a man. In other words, to refer to the hypothesis, fact is not truth, because it is ultimately impossible to verify. But a truth in the style of a myth or a story doesn't seek total verification, only a trust in its underlying ideas, which I at least have noted to be constantly present in reality. You think it's subjective. It's a bad argument. Well, okay. Let's try turning the problem around. You could say that both life and art can be abstractions. It's easy to take an event in your life and view it as, a, as, as an event in a story with its own pacing, its own significance to your character development, its own overarching plot, the materials we work with when we perform that framing process on our own memories, or our own imagination, and, you know, and on fi fictional events, are the same. From Schopenhauer, Life and dreams are leaves of one and the same book. The systematic reading is real life, but when the actual reading hour, the day, has come to an end, and we have the period of recreation, we often continue idly to thumb over the leaves, and turn to a page here and there without method or connection. We sometimes turn up a page we've already read, at others still unknown to us, but always from the same book. So, you know, again, don't take this too seriously. I'm just saying, ultimately, it comes down to what you expect from reality. It comes down to how you approach the world. They say you don't need to read up on it on a, on a country's history before you visit the place to see all of the historical sites on holiday. Don't bother ruining the surprise for yourself of what this thing is like. You know, don't read up. Make it a surprise. And some who enjoy being surprised will strongly espouse that view, but the corollary viewpoint is this. What if visiting the country changes how you view the literature? And of course it will. You won't picture anything you, re you read in the same way that you were able to before, because your views are grounded in experience rather than exclusively through the provided description. So which do you value more? The capacity for exploring a fictionalized version of a foreign country through an author's eyes, or the actual experience of seeing it? Bear in mind, by the way, before you answer, that both options can be equally emotionally powerful, both can be just as easily remembered, both contain a similar amount of pathos, provided the book is any good, and one of them saves you the cost of a plane ticket. So what do you value more? You know, the memory of the experience, or the imagination of what's probably a far more interesting experience, with the caveat that it did not happen to you. Our memories change constantly. What we conceive of as memory is mostly imagination, therefore, the experience of reading about a foreign country versus actually visiting it are situated on the same level in the human brain. They're equally true. They're going to match one another in status after a couple of months passed, provided the book was good enough, and assuming you didn't lose an arm while you were on holiday. After a couple of months, the only thing you'll, you'll be able to take away with you is the crystallized moment of time of you being there in the first place. The singular, unchangeable moment that can't be marred in reality, but will slowly change in your memory as you age. And no ultimate or completely true record of it will exist. Photographs can only ever capture the moment in which the photograph was taken. They can never get the full truth, regardless of how naturally everyone is acting and how wide the lens is, because they're not continuous. But we'll talk more about that another time. So keeping all that in mind, that the experience of traveling and the experience of reading and the experience of swimming, are uh, rendered identical through the, through the abstraction of time and memory and imagination, would you prefer to have your conception of the country that you visit influenced by reading about it, or would you rather have your idea of the literature influenced by the country? <laughs>
Remember, either experience is your first impression, in our anecdote. It doesn't particularly matter which one is true, your mind will accept them both. Fiction becomes truth before truth can assert itself through direct experience, and as time passes, that truth eventually becomes fiction itself through repeated retelling. You might say, oh, well, I didn't tell anyone about my trip. I avoided changing the, mem the memory into something abstract like words or something removed like a photograph. But every time you remembered it, your brain told you about it differently, so there's no escaping it. That's how memories work. So, as much as this might appear to be a false binary, between art and truth, which do you value more? You know, the ancient Greeks knew that there were copies of Helen everywhere. They knew what she was. They understood that a bit of Helen was in everything beautiful. And everything beautiful was, in a sense, a copy of Helen, an eidolon, because it engendered desire. That included Galatea, Pygmalion's fortunate statue, who began her life as a literal eidolon. She is a worshipped object, which gains its own sentience only in reference to Aphrodite, without whom she is nothing. Galatea cannot exist without Helen, because Helen is almost a personification of Aphrodite herself. Galatea is a signifier of Helen. Of course, we know now that Borges must have touched on this without mentioning any names when he wrote about the map of such complexity that it covered the exact area of the terrain it was mapping while being something else. You know, we only needed a short jump from that to Baudrillard. In other words, where for Pygmalion Galatea is more real than Helen or Aphrodite, even though the latter are an essential part of what she is. And of course, this is where postmodernism comes in, because where's the basis, you know? Without Helen, Galatea is nothing. Without reality, hyper-reality is also nothing. The framework can't exist without an underlying basis. The Eidolon cannot live. Galatea can't be alive without Aphrodite. Do you see what I mean about the Greeks understanding everything since the start?